love to invite you to stand. We're going to sing this morning, and we're going to start by uh, just singing and worshiping together uh, from the book of Psalms and, and reading Psalm 34. And so Allie's going to call us to worship this morning, and uh, she's going to read the, fir- read the first 10 verses, and then we're just going to jump in and sing together. Is that okay with y'all? Yeah. All right, here we go. Psalm 34, 1 through 10. I will praise the Lord at all times. My mouth will continually praise him. I will boast in the Lord. Let the oppressed hear and rejoice. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us praise his name together. I sought the Lord's help and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant. Don't let your faces be ashamed. This oppressed man cried out and the Lord heard. He saved him from all his troubles. The angel of the Lord camps around the Lord's loyal followers and delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the one who takes shelter in him. Fear the Lord, you chosen people of his, for those who fear him lack nothing. Even young lions sometimes lack food and are hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it's so good to be here uh, together. We collectively, Lord, remember what you have done for us on the cross. We are here, Lord, to experience again your goodness in the body of Christ. My hope, our hope, Lord, is that everything that we sing, everything that we say, everything that we think is magnifying to you this morning. And Lord, in a, in a few moments, when we partake of communion, when we remember your broken body and your shed blood, may you be magnified even more so in our hearts. Lord, we love you so much. You are so good. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated just for a second and listen. Um, if you are new here with us, we want to say welcome to you. Um, if you want to find out more about our church after the service is over, please find me or someone else out in the foyer who will be uh, able to answer any questions that you may have about connecting in this uh, local body of Christ. Also, um, in the seats in front of you, there's welcome cards. Um, Fill those out if you need to connect with somebody. You could put it in that metal box by the doors on your way out. And if you have been part of our church for some time, if you're part of our mission here um, to be ambassadors to our neighbors, uh, to the next generation, and to the nations, then we would always, as we do each Sunday, we ask you to invest here uh, monetarily. Uh, you can give here locally this morning through that same box. You can give online uh, or through the mail. And speaking of the next generation, we are blessed to have a lot of kids in this church, and may it always be so. Or we have one of our focus, or foci, foci, we focus a lot on the next generation, all right? And um, we care very much about them. Uh, in just a few moments, uh, even a couple of our sixth graders are going to help us this morning in leading us in the Lord's Supper. But in order to really minister better to the next generation, we are looking for a staff person now. We are looking for a part-time person who would really just give oversight and focus to that age group. So there's a website right there, you find it. I encourage all of you to go to the website, look at that job description, and if you're on our newsletter, you saw that this week as well. If you know anybody, anybody that might be interested, might be the appropriate person for this, uh, then have them go there. Show them where that is, and we'll see what the Lord has for us in the future, all right? Okay, now let's, now we're going to transition now into the Lord's Supper. And here's what we're going to do this morning. Um, we are going to, in just a moment, we're going to sing a very appropriate song, right? Uh, Jesus paid it all. And so during this song, a couple of things we ask you to do. Number one, if you did not get the elements this morning, uh, they're on the table right back there. We encourage you during this song to go up and get one. Um, and also, we encourage you to reflect on the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And who is this for, the Lord's Supper? It's for any believer. If you are a Christian, if you have believed not just that Jesus existed, but if you believed in Jesus because of his death and resurrection, then this is a moment for you, for us to share together. So do that, and so here's what we're gonna do. After the song's over, uh, we are all going to partake uh, together at the same time. So right now, let, let's sing, let's worship, let's reflect, and, um, and we'll continue to worship.
Matthew 26, 26. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Let us eat. Matthew 26, 27 through 28. And when he had taken the cup, taken a cup, and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for forgiveness of, all, of sins. Let us drink. Amen. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Jude. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we partake of these elements this morning, we remember the price that you paid. And we know, Lord, that you paid it all. And that gives us the opportunity um, to live free lives, new lives, 
filled with your spirit, led by your spirit. Lord, we are so very thankful. Be honored this morning. Be honored in our lives from this moment moving forward. We give all praise to Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. And if you would, everybody, let's please stand and let's continue to worship. And right now we're going to dismiss um, all of our kids, kindergarten through sixth grade this morning. Um, and let's, let's sing together. Stop.
for us and the life that he lived and his resurrection, God, that um, that we have salvation and we have been rescued. And um, God, that's a foundation that we can build our life on and in hopes that your spirit would come live in us and that, that you would leave us, lead us in a life of obedience to you, uh, being people who love you but also love our neighbors around us. And uh, God, we thank you for that, that we can share that hope with others. God, we're grateful that we can sing this together this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, worship team. And uh, they're not in here now. They went to the 56ers every now and then have a special breakfast time. They're watching us live stream in the other room. Uh, but thanks to Jude and Hannah, that was awesome for them leading us in the Lord's Supper. If you have a copy of God's Word, uh, I encourage you to go ahead and open it to um, Colossians chapter 2. We're going to continue in that in just a moment. Colossians 2 is where we will be. <laughs> Well, um, it's, it's a movie that's several years old now, but it also looks decades back to when Notre Dame football was relevant. Um, is Rudy? Sorry, I just like to say that. Um, yeah. uh, it was it was the movie Rudy. Um, whether it's historically accurate or not, at least it's inspiring when you watch it. Um, the guy who came from nothing and just kept working and kept working and then he finally you know made the team and then he got to play like at the very end of one game but the whole idea of 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 the that team and and the work put in and all that it's why that movie's great but there's a scene right before that last game in the locker room um with um coach dan divine and uh, his these these are his final words, um, particularly to the seniors. Their final se- final game of their final season, and he gives them these words um, uh, to warn them and to remind them of who they are, trying to inspire them to victory. And so um, they gather around. It's minutes before they're going to leave the tunnel, and he said, "This remember." No one, and I mean no one, comes into our house and pushes us around. It's pretty good, powerful words. He's trying to warn and remind them in order to inspire them to victory. No one, let no one come in our house and push us around. And that's what's going to ring throughout the passage today. In fact, it was in the passage last week, and I'll show you it's in the passage for next week. We're in the section, no one should come in and push us around. We need to be warned, though, that it's possible. But we also need to be inspired as to who we are and remember who we are, particularly because of Christ. We're going to look at um, Colossians 2, verses 8 through 15. If you're there, start pick me up in verse 8. Colossians 2, this is Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. He writes it again, remember, from a prison cell. I would have been thinking about myself. Paul is writing to warn and inspire 
and encourage and remind the, the believers there and us today. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. And he is head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross." When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I said that this is um, Paul, similar to Coach Divine. He's looking to warn and remind the Colossians and also us. Let no one come in and push you around. In fact, I want you to sneak uh, I want you to be so encouraged um, by how simple I'm going to point something out right here. It's simply looking at your English Bible and seeing a phrase again and again. Look at 2-4. This is Paul was already picking up on his concern. Uh, he doesn't know many of these folks, but he has a love for them and a commitment to them, and he wants them to know Christ who, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He says in verse 4, I say this, why? So that no one will delude you. That means water down what you believe, spread you thin, move you off of what we just sang about the firm foundation. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. Drop down to 16. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink in respect to festival or new moon or Sabbath day. Drop down to 18. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, on and on and on. It's a simple observation, but all of chapter 2 is why Paul is writing them. Epaphras, of whom and from whom Paul heard the report of the Colossians, that they came to faith in Christ, and it was a robust faith, and they had a, a spilling out love for one another. That's why he says, I thank my God when I pray for you because of the faith you have in the Lord Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints. And then he says, in fact, I continue to pray that you'd be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Why? So that you may walk in a manner worthy of him, please him in all respects, bearing spiritual freedom in every good work, and increasing in your knowledge of him, being strengthened by him, overflowing with gratitude, because he transferred you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Paul is animated, and he prays, and his prayers are animated. They're not generic. Be with them. He thanks God for them, for their faith in Christ, for their love for one another, but he knows that could be dicey at times, particularly if the world's wisdom, if the world's philosophy, if the philosophy, which he actually says in 2.8, the philosophy that's being circulated and percolated in the Colossian church, this is within their house. That someone or several someones are hijacking the gospel. They're saying, that was great that you started with Jesus, but hey, now we've got kind of the inside track to some of the secret knowledge you could have because then you'd really be getting in on life. But right now you lack. You don't have the fullness. You don't have the knowledge. They threw all this jargon around to sound like the spiritual insiders. And that's intriguing. It perks anyone's ears up. But I want you to hear first and foremost, this entire chapter, Paul is addressing that. This is why he's writing the letter. He's agitated. He's on guard for, he's on lookout for, 
He wants to shepherd them away from. He wants to alert them. He wants to remind them. And he wants to warn them. And so as we go through um, this passage, um, there's a lot in it. I mean, it is thick. But we've already rehearsed it by taking the Lord's Supper. We've already sung it. We've already prayed it. And if you, are, if you come to faith in Christ, what we're going to go through today is by way of reminder so that we not be taken captive, but we become more captivated with the one who made us complete in himself. That he is enough for you. All of the letter of Colossians, Paul is saying, I know this is going on. I know they're bending your ear. I know they're pulling the rug out from in underneath you. You feel like you're on shaky ground. I say this so that no one will delude you. In fact, I want you to have uh, a disciplined faith, an ordered faith. I want you to have stability and then vitality. Last week we looked at 2, 6, and 7. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Having been, it already happened, having been firmly rooted in him and established in your faith. And then the, he ends with overflowing with gratitude. You remember we said last week, if you were here, that's, the actual, that's actually the first command given in Colossians. Paul is, is, is not interested in giving them uh, a to-do list and a to-don't list. But the people that are with this philosophy are majoring in those things. Well, here's all the things you need to be doing. Oh, you're not doing that. Why aren't you doing that? Oh, you don't have this or you have been doing this. You're not quite there. You're almost there. And Paul's saying, no one comes into our house and pushes us around. So we think of Paul, yes, we probably think of Paul as more aggressive than Jesus in our warped mindset. But Jesus had the same, you want to get the hair on the back of Jesus' neck popping up? Just be a religious leader who helps everybody obsess over what you did on the Sabbath. We, we've talked about that many times. And a similar thing is happening here. The traditions of, of men, both Jewish traditions, as well as just elementary, elementary principles or elemental principles of the world, like basics. That word literally means like things in a row or sequence. So it was used of the alphabet. Uh, if they had rankings of, you know, basketball teams that have been ranked in a row. But it also, some of your Bibles say the elemental spirits of the world, because underneath human tradition, which is not God's word, that's not bad all the time, but when it becomes primary and supreme, Paul says, now we're out of line. And if any of those things, including the demonic forces wanting to use, you know, the basic things of life and get like he'll talk about next week, hey, let's, have, let's eat this and don't eat this. And he said, all of a sudden you are obsessed, your eye is off the ball, you're obsessed with all of these additions when Jesus is enough. And so I want you to see that. No one, no one, no one. But the command, this is the second command in Colossians, it's see to it that no one takes you captive. See to it, it's literally um, the word, uh, one of the words to see, but it's the idea to see not with the eyeball, but through the eyeball with your mind's being on alert. It means to pick up on the signals, read the room, read underneath what's being told you so that you are not taken captive. That word there, that reminds me of almost every, um, in our house right now, we kind of like the FBI series. Um, not so much most wanted, but maybe because of this very picture that Paul's giving. When he says, see to it that no one take you captive, through empty philosophy and deceptive. Basically, it's a philosophy that's empty and deceptive. That's what he's saying. It's not two different things. But that's how they do it. But they're going to take you captive in the FBI series, um, particularly the most wanted ones. It seems like every week somebody is getting, um, it's human trafficking or someone's getting kidnapped. In fact, sometimes we have to turn it off because we can't handle it. But that's, that's a dark picture and Paul paints that picture to say, it's not only possible, particularly with what's going on, and they're giving you plausible arguments. He says, I don't want you to be deluded by persuasive or plausible or fine-sounding arguments. 
all those things, they're tickling your ear. They're kind of what you, that sounds good. That sounds true. Yeah, I've been feeling lately like I don't have it all together. Here's what you need. He says, it's going to take you off captive. So don't read it and go, yeah, we kind of, you know, we kind of got a little bit off kilter. No, you've been physically or, or metaphorically, you've been taken captive. You've been kidnapped away from life and life that is to the full, which Jesus came to give. He says, that's what I am after and against. And that's what I'm in your, in your, uh, it's not in your English probably, when he says um, being taken captive by philosophy, it's, ri- it's literally the philosophy. And I think by that, most commentators would say this, he's saying, I'm pinpointing not philosophy. Paul's not anti-philosophy, which means lover of wisdom. He's saying, I'm anti the philosophy that's being circulated around there that's toxic and that is taking many of you or tempting many of you um, their way and alluring you to being taken captive. He said, that's what we've got to be on the alert um, for. Why is it so alluring to them? Well, the philosophy, and and we'll talk about this more next week, this is kind of a mixture of um, it wouldn't be alluring or it wouldn't be tempting and all of a sudden like, whoa, how did I find myself here taken captive if it was crazy? He's not, they're not giving you some just way out in left field. They're actually some mixture of some scripture. And then there's some mixture of, um, there's a little bit of a Jewish element, probably a strong Jewish element, particularly in the traditions. Um, There's also a mysticism, a pagan mysticism. There's a worship of angels. Part of why that was is um, particularly in, in, you know, the Greek culture, you would have had this, this idea that, well, God couldn't, um, you know, God's spirit and things that are of matter are evil. And so what God needs to do in order to relate to us, he has these emanations. Like, in other words, like, well, this, one, this one's fully God, and then this one's a little less God, and let's get all the way down here until it's accessible to us. And so they would have put Jesus in that category. It's, this is a mixture. Again, this is a stew, if you will, of thoughts. Trying to answer, what does philosophy do? It's trying to raise and answer the, the essential questions of life, of existence, of meaning, of purpose, of identity. And so they're, they're saying, as you try to find your place in the world and you try to find where Jesus' place is, several of them of this would have said, well, he wasn't God. He was an, one of the emanations. Or if he's God, he wasn't man. And you're going to see in just a moment, we'll see in just a moment. That's why Paul is very careful to say, in him all the fullness of deity dwells. So before we get really lost there, come to our world. Why would, and what are the empty philosophies of our day? There's a lot of empty philosophies. Um, And, you know, some of us would say, yeah, that's right. All about the traditions of men and religious, you know, do's and don'ts. And that's, that's why I haven't been to church in a while or whatever. That's and that's, that's true. We can get off base there, but it also just works in our world. This idea that they're saying, well, you kind of relax enough religious I's dotted and T's crossed, but it also works in our world where you're told that, well, until you reach this status financially, socially, until you uh, have this career path figured out, until you uh, are able to sit, you know, students until you're able to sit at this table or hang out with these folks, your life's not enough. Um, it's not, it's not just this current generation. It's all generations ask these three questions because, and this, I'm saying this because this is why Paul knows we could easily be taken and allured into this captiveness because we're all asking these questions. Who am I? Where do I fit? And what difference can I make? If you're a parent, um, your, your children, your teenagers are asking those questions whether they know it or not. The hard part is we're still asking and trying to answer them ourselves, right? But we're also trying to help them answer them. And so much in our world today is empty philosophy with enough truth and or that sounds good or that sounds right 
that where we can be taken captive, see also how many genders do we have, sexual orientation um, questions. And I'm not, uh, I'm not mocking them. The reason why those things are so alive is because the question of who am I and where do I fit is so never ending in us. And for them back in their day, they had empty philosophies. That, That's right. You're not enough in this. You lack this. If you only had this, if you only knew this secret stuff. And Paul's saying, see to it that no one comes in our house and pushes us around. See that no one comes into our house and takes you away captive. Because what you'll find eventually is it's an empty deception. Yes, it sounded true. For example, some of the ways we'll mix in spiritual things into that whole identity stuff that's that's you know a waged war in our culture is well god's only loving so god doesn't really have standard i mean he's just loving and and if god were really loving then he wouldn't even hold anyone to this kind of standard that sounds true because god is loving god is love and yet it's it's um it's a hijacking of that and an elevating of that without holding intention that he's also holy and just, yes, merciful and compassionate and wrathful. Uh, one time I had a friend that was like, hey, why do we sing all these songs about, you know, celebrating and joy? We don't ever sing this song about God's wrath. <laughs> he's like, he's just fully wrathful too. I'm like, yeah, I don't think that would sell the, on the charts very well. But that even shows if we only think of God as compassionate and gracious, which we should always think of him that way, and only loving, but by that what we mean is he lets me do what I want. He lets me live how I live. Then we don't have a complete picture of God, and we can easily be hijacked. We can easily be kidnapped into that because that feels good. That gets me toward maybe I can be acceptable. And so as we struggle in our own culture, it's not just teenagers. It's not just your children. It's you and me uh, in our world. You're middle-aged or you're at the end of life still asking or still feeling this. And I just want to give you this statement and what would you fill in? I am not blank enough. I'm not blank enough. I'm not athletic enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not sought after enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not competent enough. I'm not noticed enough. I'm not wanted enough. I'm not righteous enough. How would God have anything to do with me? I'm not clean enough. I'm not put together enough. Why can't I be more like them? I'm not acceptable enough. Any and all of those Every person sitting in here, the person sitting next to you that you think is all put together, asks those or says those things at times. Why? Because we're human, we're frail. But Paul would say, let no one come into this house. Let no one get in your head and kidnap you with the lie that you are not blank enough. Now, let me pause. If in my job I need to gain some skill, great. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about more foundationally of who you are and what is really true about you if you are in Christ. And Paul's saying, they're getting you, they're pulling you away, they're taking you into captivity because that's, that's going through your heart and head. I'm not blank enough, and they're filling in my blank for me, or they're filling in where I could be enough if I did this or that. So we get to, that's his warning. Now we get to why, and we're going to kind of pick up the pace. Uh, in verses 9 and 10, we see why. Why does Paul call them and us to be alert and to resist? Well, it's two reasons, because of who Jesus is and who we are. So because of who Jesus is and who we are, look at verse 9, 4. Again, simple buddy observation, not bright. The first word, for. 
So see to it that nobody takes you captive. Resist that. Don't be taken captive. Why? For, because in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. We don't get this, but his answer to the problem of us feeling like we lack or being tempted to think we don't, uh, we don't have the resources to live a life pleasing to God, I'm behind, I'm not enough, all of those things. He's talking to believers. He says the reason why you and I can resist is for, because of who Jesus is. Who is he? He's God. He is God in, in his, all his fullness not an emanation, not kind of down the ladder, and you can kind of work your way up the ladder too. No. In him, all the fullness of deity dwells. So he's not a demigod. He's not havesies. And notice, it's dwells is uh, present tense. It's ongoing and never ending. But also, he says, and this is, this is hitting on one of those um, heresies there, that maybe Jesus was just looked like he was a man, but he wasn't. He is, the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Paul, Paul is very intentional in using that. He's talking about that Jesus is God incarnate. That's a fancy word. It means in the flesh, that he became human. He has always been the second person of the triune God, the Son of God. But in the fullness of time, he became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, glories of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. He says, we can resist being taken captive by empty philosophies that tempt us because they tell us we don't have what it takes. We don't have enough. We lack. For Jesus was a good starting point, but you need to add to him. No. We can resist that. It's a lie. We can see to it that we don't get there because seeing to it, we see through the lie. We can do so because of who Jesus is. He is God in the flesh. He's always been God, but he became man. And after his incarnation and resurrection and ascension, he will always be the God man, God dash man, fully God, fully human, not a little less in one category or the other. He's fully God and fully man. And so, because of who he is, we can resist and not be taken captive. But it's also because of who we are, because of who you and I are, if you have trusted Jesus, who we are in him. Look at the, the next phrase. And in him, you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. So it's because of who we are in him. You have been made complete. How or where? It's better location. In him. I want you to note this. It's a passive verb. You didn't make yourself complete. You have been made complete. It's also a past tense verb. It's the kind where it's, you have been made complete at a point when you trusted him and it has forward-rolling implications. Meaning, done deal, you have been made complete, and now that, com that completedness gets lived out and lived into rolling forward forever. So that when we say Jesus paid it all, we can say, when, um, and when before the throne I stand in him complete. The only way we know it can be confident we stand in him complete then is he's already made you complete. Now, in another sense, sanctification, as he says, talks about in 128, he does all he does, admonishes others and teaches others so that he may present every person complete in Christ. That God's doing the completing deal to make us more like his son. He says, I want you to mature in Christ. And part of that maturity is stability and, and, and a vitality of a walk with him because you understand more and more you don't have to be enough. You're not enough on your own, but he is enough, and he has made you complete in him. We are not the fullness of God, but of his fullness we partake. And so that is what's true of you and me. Now, um, I want you to make the note I, I, uh, I pointed out in him. 
We'll see it in a moment. In him and with him, or in this, or through him, or in this passage, seven times. I think the emphasis is not on you and me pulling up our bootstraps, dotting our religious I's, crossing our religious T's, getting your act together. It's because of who you are positionally in him and who he's made you and me to be with him in the life that he has given us, and then he calls us um, to live out. And so we can resist, and the reason why we can is because of who he is and who he has made us to be. So human philosophy, when we see to it that we're alert, we can see through it, that it, that it is empty, that it's a lie, that it's a deception. When it takes us, when it's not built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, who he is and who we are because of him. Human philosophy on its own without with Christ not in the equation or at least lessened, it leaves you and me empty and takes us captive. But in him, we have been made complete. Well, how did he make us spiritually complete? That, that's the next slide. Verses 11 through 15, we're going to see how Jesus made us spiritually complete. He says, uh, first of all, he, he's given us new life in him and with him by giving us a complete identity in him and with him. And we see that in verses uh, 11 and 12 and 13. Uh, and in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So when he says that, um, we've been given spiritual circumcision. Circumcision really fast. What Paul would say is some of what they were uh, camping on in Colossae, which is also in other New Testament churches, the Jewish faction is really wanting you to kind of go through the Jewish hoops before you can really be part. And circumcision was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. I want you to note this. Abraham was circumcised well after he believed. That's just an important thing to point out. And circumcision, for them, it means literally a cutting off of the flesh. It's cutting off of a particular part of the flesh that was a sign of that uh, Abrahamic covenant God made with Abraham that he would, be, he would bless him and make him a blessing to all the nations. And so the nation of Israel, coming from Abraham's uh, family, all males were to be circumcised as an outward sign of an inward commitment of the family to be God's people and to obey him. But he says, we've been given something better. Because ultimately, even in the Old Testament, there were passages like in Deuteronomy, um, Deuteronomy 10, where God tells them, circumcise your hearts. Therefore, do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is the God of gods, Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, shows no partiality, accepts no bribes. And then in Deuteronomy 30, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. So he tells them to do it, and then he's like, but I'm really going to have to do it. Because what I'm talking about here is you're, you getting a new heart. He says, the Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants, so that you may love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and live. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies who hate and persecute you. And so what God has always been after through that outward physical sign is I, I want you to to be my people circumcised in heart. And he ultimately knew that we would fail and that the law would not get us there. And so a new covenant that we celebrated, as Jude said, the new covenant in my blood, through that, now we belong to him and we've been circumcised in heart. That's what it means, the circumcision of Christ. When he uh, took our sin on himself and died, uh, taking our sin on himself as your place taker and mine, he was cut off from God so that we could be cut off unto God, so that we could be circumcised to God. Elsewhere it says we've been given a heart uh, instead of stone, a flesh. We've been given a new heart, a new disposition. We are a new creation in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. The old sinful nature still lags and drags us around, but we have been, we have a new identity in Christ because we've been circumcised with him. The next thing he mentions uh, is something that we also have a picture in around here. Uh, having been buried with him in baptism. Now here he's talking about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So again, spiritual baptism. 
not water, but the water baptism is a picture of that. He says that we have been, um, when Christ died, we died with him, in which you also, excuse me, having been buried with him in baptism. Again, baptism means identification. So he's given us a new identity in him. When he died, somehow we died with him. When he was raised, we were raised with him. These are spiritual realities of your new identity. You want to know who you are? If you are in Jesus Christ, you are in Christ, and you are with Christ, and it was none of your doing, and therefore there's none, nothing you can do to make it an undoing. And he says, you've been buried with him in his death, and you've also been raised um, with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. What's the point? We, we receive that identity as we believe the working of God. It's faith. It's not outward circumcision. It's not going under waters. They only picture what has already happened inside, spiritually for a person. That's why we say, buried with Christ in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. It's only a picture of a spiritual reality. He's already won, and he's already given, and it's been the working of God. One other thing I don't have time to go on, maybe we'll go through next week. I, I'd love to encourage you to, even just in a skimming reading of Colossians this week, see how many verbs in Colossians are the working of God, not us. We think, I need to get my act together. I better do all these commands. There are some commands in here, but they're, 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 they're very minute compared to all that God has done so that we might walk in this newness of life, in this new identity, so we'd have stability and vitality and gratitude overflowing. And then he says, um, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. So the last part of our new identity is that not only were we buried with him and raised with him, he made us alive. You were dead. If you're sick, you need a doctor. If you're dead, you need a savior. He made us alive together with him. That is all the work of God. I didn't give a pinky up to help. You were a corpse. Put a toe tag on you. That's who you were. That's what he says. When you were dead in your transgression, that's part of your story. But he says, now, when you were there, God did a work and made you alive together with him. The next uh, reality of being complete in him is the, uh, that he gives us new life. He makes us alive together with him through complete forgiveness. The next phrase, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Underline the word all. The ones before you came to Christ, the ones you did this morning, and the ones that you will commit. And transgression means I'm not so like, oh, I didn't even realize that was a sin. It was like, I see the boundary and I step over the boundary. And he has forgiven all of our transgressions and he has canceled out the debt, the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. Uh, what this is, is if you owed somebody uh, money, um, the word literally is like a handwritten note that's what the Greek says. Here's a, it's like a handwritten note that you would have written, and you had to do it in your own hand to say, I own that I owe you, Mason, for that HVAC unit. Now I got to write that out in handwritten, and then when I don't come good on that, you know, paying you, then I get thrown in the slammer, and they would have put it, your handwritten note, above your cell block. Okay? What does that remind us of? In the Gospels, when Jesus is put on the cross, they put a note. It's a little more, you know, solid than handwritten above his cross. And remember, the Jews are upset. Like, don't call him the king of the Jews. You know, just say he said he was. What, what were they doing? The crucifixion, anybody crucified, it was a humiliating, shameful thing basically to keep Rome's thumb over everybody and say, see, if you do something out of line, you're going there too. But they made them carry their cross to identify and say, I am the criminal. Jesus didn't carry his cross the whole way, by the way. And when you got there, often they'd say, here's what, here's their debt they owed. Here's the crime they committed. He says he canceled uh, out the certificate of debt. 
And literally back then they would have had paper like papyrus where often uh, he says that he, he um, excuse me, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile, and he has taken it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. It, it means like to wipe it away. They would have had papyrus back then and even the inks and stuff would have not been as permanent. It's not a Sharpie. And they could have wiped it off, or sometimes they use wax, and you can wipe that wax slate, and it's as if it was never there. The good news of the gospel is no matter how awful you are, no, how ma no matter how criminal in your intentions, no matter how vicious and backbiting you are, no matter how arrogant and shaking your fist at God you are, no matter how self-righteous you are, he's wiped it away. And he can only wipe it away and only say on the cross, it is finished, if indeed he took your sin and my sin in his flesh, in his body, on the cross, shed his blood for us so that it could be wiped away. And he says, canceled. In fact, in their culture, they would have put a big X over that certificate of debt to say it's paid, it's done. And God raised him from the dead to say, yes, and that is the victory. So we've been given a complete new identity in him and with him. We've been given new life through complete forgiveness. And then we have new life through complete victory over sin and death. Verses 15, verse 15. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. God made a public display of the rulers and authorities. You sneak a peek back up at verse 10. This is kind of a bracket. He is head over all ruler and authority. Um, he's letting you know he is head over all rule and authority. When they thought they had shamed him and put him to a shameful death and humiliating death, actually it became a source of life for us because it's a victory over sin, death, and Satan that he has won. That's why when we sing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, we can sing, he breaks the power of canceled sin because it's already been paid. It's already been wiped away. And so we're not trying to be inspired to victory, but we live life in him and with him from the victory he's already secured. Now, Paul gives a, a really um, good word picture here. He talks about that he disarms them. It's basically literally stripping them away. Um, both the earthly authorities at the time, but particularly those behind them, Satan and his demons. He strips away their power, they're powerless, and he makes a public spectacle of them in the cross. And, and he gives a picture here of a Roman triumph. Um, two things. The gospel means good news, but did you know what it really has the picture of is the good news of an announcement of a victory won in a foreign land of our enemies. And you come an euangelion. Or you give an euangelion, a good news of the enemy's been defeated. We are now secure and free, and, and, and we can live with confidence and joy and not afraid and tremoring or taken captive. And we definitely don't need to go live in enemy, the enemy territory. But he gives a picture of a Roman triumph where the general would come back, and he would actually cart back with him the conquered king, oftentimes in very humiliating, oftentimes stripped naked, oftentimes in chains, not only him, but his whole family and all his dignitaries and his army. And I'm not going to read it, but there was one that I read this week, uh, Plutarch uh, did where he talked about, he just said uh, it was a massive, massive procession. It was three days long, and the conquered king didn't even get to show up until the third day. They were dragging off all the, all the booty, all the spoils of war. They were bringing all the, you know, the gold trinkets and, the, they, and all these wagons. I mean, they, they put on a parade. But it's when they dragged the conquered uh, king in that they also had many of, many of their weapons, spears and um, they also defensive things, shields, and loosely put them together so that as they came through the town, it clanged. It made all the noise to say, look at this, and then look at this guy we conquered. How pathetic and impotent is he, and how victorious are we? Now, most of us don't walk through our Christian life like that. 
But Paul would say, let no one come into our house and deceive us and draw us off sides. And particularly, let no one push us around because we are not ones who've got to be inspired to victory. But we have been ones that just simply need to be reminded of all we have in Christ, that he's made you and me complete, and that he is enough for whatever your needs are. And you are in him and been made alive together with him. He is the conquering king, conquered your greatest enemy, sin and death conquered our enemy personally, Satan and his demons, so that we might be part of his victory parade. Paul says it in 2 Corinthians, that he always leads us in his triumph. The Christian life is, is, a, is a triumphal procession following our leader, Jesus Christ. Romans 8. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. I'm going to read Romans 8, and we're going to sing, and we'll be out of here. If I can find Romans 8 in my notes here. <laughs> There we go. Because the two things I want to I want to put before us in Romans eight will help us gather together. First of all, as Paul commands, see to it so that you and I might see through whatever it is where you feel like you have lack, you have you don't have what you need. You have all you need in Jesus Christ. We need to be alert. We need to be bewaring. Be aware. But see to it. Give attention to where you give attention. And make sure that it is becoming more and more being captivated by the one who made you complete. Be captivated by him. Be enthralled with him. Be floored that he would do such merciful things and gracious things for you and for me when we don't deserve it. Part of that C2 it. Mike mentioned we're looking for a kids coordinator. The reason why that position is so vital is not because they're going to fix all your kids and they're going to they're gonna make sure, but they're definitely going to come alongside and partner with us to equip the next generation of Christ ambassadors who, because of their faith in Christ, will also live triumphantly. But most of us old folks know life seems to even be more hostile and hard and so we want somebody, it's very important, this person comes, along, comes in and encourages and volunteers and helps us equip, and alongside you, equip your children in these truths so that they might walk with stability and their lives might have a vitality. And so that's why it's so, so important. Well, I'm going to end with Romans 8. You can stand. This will be our benediction pre the closing song. Romans 8, 1, and then verses 31 to 39. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against you because you're God's elect if you're in Christ? God is the one who justifies. Who's the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and who also intercedes for us, for you, for me. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But... In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Let's sing of that firm foundation and walk out of here with our footing firmed up, not in ourselves, but in the one who made you and me complete because he is completely and fully God. But I still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be good. 